Hey everybody, welcome back to our week two lecture. This is part two, looking at questions of religious terrorism um, with a focus on Jewish and Hindu um, cases. So in this uh, chapter on Zion betrayed by Jürgens Meyer, we delve into sort of the militant religious worldview of Jews and particularly um, as they play out in politics in Israel. Um, so one of the sort of focal cases in our readings this um, week was Mir Ettinger, young um, Jewish religious activist in Israel who was arrested in 2015 um, on suspicions of bombing Palestinian homes in Duma. And you can see this quote at the top from Mir Ettinger. He said, the key is not to seek to delay the explosion, but to try to bring it on as soon as possible and on our own initiative. So this is very much this idea Jürgens Meyer is talking about of um, militant religious activists who feel that they have a, a positive obligation to kind of bring about um, these political changes within their given society um, based on their theological understanding of the world. Now, the, as Jürgens Meyer notes, the implication of um, Edinger's comments and um, statements around this period was that the whole of biblical Israel, including the West Bank, should be purged of Arabs, Muslims, and Christians, and ethnically cleansed to satisfy a religious vision of a Jewish state. Now, it's important to remember that Edinger is the grandson of Rabbi Mir Kahan, who was considered by many to be the father of kind of extreme far-right Jewish politics and political movements, and kind of gave birth to the Kahanist religious movement um, after his death. So the 2015 um, firebomb attacks on the Arab town of Duma as well as hundreds of other attacks on Palestinian and Arab Israeli towns and villages um, have been blamed on um, a mix of these militant Jewish uh, religious activists and uh, young settlers often associated with these hilltop gangs of which Edinger um, was a leader. Now, the Jewish extremists claim that the fulfillment of the vision of Israel as a Jewish state requires the expropriation of all the biblical lands of Israel, including the territories of ancient Israel's Judea and Samaria, which today encompass um, the West Bank of Palestine. Now, many of these views can be traced back to um, extremist uh, Mir Kahan, this, as we noted, the grandfather um, and kind of the ideological inspiration for Mir Edinger's extremist politics. And in fact, as uh, Jürgens Meyer notes, many of Kahan's earlier followers saw in Edinger kind of a re, uh, sort of reintroduction or a restoration of these same um, political views, including the idea that Israel was intended to be not just a secular state, but the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and the notion that the secular Israeli state cannot be trusted and the Palestinian Arabs must go. Now, Kahan was um, um, born in Brooklyn, New York, um, and was a co-founder of the Jewish Defense League, or the JDL, uh, sorry, co-founder of the JDL and founder of the ultranationalist Koch Party um, from 1984 to 1988, um, prior to it being banned by the Israeli Knesset, the um, government there. And Kahan's militant Jewish ideas, um, as I noted, came to be known as Kahanism. Now, uh, Kahan was killed in when he was back um, on tour in New York City in 1990, um, by an Egyptian militant named El Sayed Nasser, who, as we read later, um, fit into this kind of larger story um, of, <clears throat> excuse me, Islamic politics in the United States. You can see Mir Kahan pictured there at a rally um, in Israel in the 1980s. So this is a brief clip from 1988 when Mir Kahan was running for the Israeli Knesset. Um, and you get a sense here from this brief clip of his politics and how he saw um, this issue of the rightful place of Jews in Israel, as well as the problem of Muslims on Jewish land. This isn't Israel. It's Palestine. Arabs, Arabs, and more Arabs. What will happen in another 10 years? How many Arabs will be living here? In 1967, we had a golden opportunity. When we liberated the city, we could have removed them all, 
They expected us to slaughter them, but there was no need for physical harm. Just transfer. Out. We missed our chance. It was a serious mistake for all generations. Jerusalem, a Jewish city, the Jewish capital. But Jews are afraid to walk here today. In the evening, there are no Jews here. They're afraid. Jews are stoned and stabbed. But the Arabs are not afraid. Tell me, who are the conquerors and who are the conquered here? Will this city be Yerushalayim or Al-Quds? We have to decide now because time is running out. So you can see from um, that brief political ad, sort of this was the kind of political um, vision that Mir Kahan was running on um, in 1988 um, for the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. Now, as Mir Edinger wrote in 2013 in a document he called his Rebel Manifesto, the idea of the rebellion is very simple. Israel has many weak points many issues which it handles by walking on eggshells so as to not attract attention. What we're going to do is simply fire up these powder kegs. The aim is to bring down the state, to bring down its structure and its ability to control and to build a new system. To do it, we must act outside the rules of the state we seek to bring down. Now, as Jürgen Meyer points out, and as um, Edinger made clear in his 2013 manifesto, he refused to participate in Israeli politics because he regarded the present state of Israel and its acceptance of multiculturalism as a hindrance to the religious vision of biblical Israel. He advocated the destruction of the present state of Israel in order to make way for the coming religious state. According to both Edinger and Kahan, the true creation of a religious Israel was yet to come. Unlike other Jewish conservatives who held this point of view, however, they felt that it was going to happen fairly soon and that they and their partisans could help bring about this messianic act. So, for example, when he uh, was talking about his interviews with Mir Kahan before he had died, um, Jürgen Meyer notes that what he and his grandson now, uh, Mir Edinger, truly detest was the secular Jewish state. Anticipating the hatred that would animate a religious Jew like um, Yigal Amir into assassinating the Prime Minister of Israel, Kahan said that although he loved all Jews, secular government is the enemy. And for that reason, supporters of the secular state must be treated as major obstacles to the coming of the Messiah. So this opposition to secular Israeli society and the Israeli state um, very closely echoes what we heard from the Christian identity and Christian reconstruction movement advocates um, and other religious militants who are involved in these um, kind of various political struggles who base their actions on um, belief in a biblical law or some kind of divine authority. So the idea of just war that we were just thinking about in the Christian context with figures like Michael Bray um, see their echoes also with these Jewish militants. Um, these, um, as Jürgen Meyer notes, when he talked to these religious militants in Israel, they reminded him that Jewish law allowed for two kinds of just war, um, obligatory and permissible. The former was required for defense, and the latter was allowed when it seemed prudent for a state to do so. As Jürgens Meyer um, continues, the determination of when the conditions existed for a just war were to be made by accounts of elders, the Sanhedrin, or the prophet in the case of a permissible war. In the case of an obligatory war, the determination could be made by a government ruled by Jewish law, the halakhic state. But since none of these religious entities exist today, the conditions were determined by an authoritative interpreter of the halakha, such as a rabbi. I mean, as he notes, Khan, of course, because he was a rabbi, um, could essentially justify his own um, political actions as being kind of morally approved. Um, and in the film I asked folks to watch for this week, um, Incitement, we see um, very much how uh, the character is playing um, Egal Amir is going out kind of seeking these different rabbis, um, asking for this kind of legitimation for his actions. Now, these kind of interpretations about obligatory or permissible war um, in part draw on earlier Jewish history. So looking at the Maccabean Revolt in, from 166 to 164 BCE, or the Revolt of uh, Masada in 73 CE, um, both of which involved Jewish partisans fighting against um, state agents 
um, in what were understood by Jews at that time as religiously sanctioned conflicts to defend Judaism. So we see modern Jewish religious militant activists kind of looking back at some of these earlier examples to find justifications for contemporary acts. And it's kind of precisely these radical Jewish religious views that were advanced by Khan and others that inspired um, Yigal Amir, who assassinated um, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1995. So um, Amir, like many young radical Jews at that time, felt that the Israeli negotiations with the Palestinians and um, other international parties, particularly through the Oslo Peace Accords, um, Accord 1 in 1993, Accord 2 in 1995, and then the later Y River negotiations in 1998 um, under President Clinton, um, were a betrayal of both the Israeli and radical Jewish calls for this exclusive Jewish state um, that would include all the contemporary lands um, that Palestinians live on. And it was precisely these kind of hardline Jewish views that got a boost um, after Rabin's assassination when um, Benjamin Netanyahu came to power. Now, our readings um, looked at individuals like Joel Lerner, who was another Jewish militant religious activist um, who advanced a similar set of ideas as um, Kahan following his death in 1990. So, for example, uh, as Jurgen's Meyer notes, um, Joel Lerner was one of those activists that rejected any Palestinian claims on what he regarded as biblical Israel. He hoped for the restoration of the ancient Temple of Jerusalem, the exclusive right of Jews to settle in the West Bank of the Jordan River, and the creation of a state based on biblical law. Now, it's important to note that Lerner was one of these um, Jewish extremists that was involved in a series of attacks, including a plot to blow up the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslim shrine adjacent to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And uh, Jürgen's Meyer notes that when he interviewed Lerner in the past, um, Lerner believed in a form of Messianic Judaism. Um, in, his, in his view, the prophesied uh, Messiah would come to earth only after the temple was rebuilt and made ready for him. Thus, the issue of the temple was not only a matter of cultural nostalgia, but also one of pressing religious importance. After all, Jürgen's Meyer notes, Lerner pointed out many of the laws incumbent on Jews in the Bible are related to temple ritual, and Jews can hardly obey these laws if there's no temple in which to perform them. So in Lerner's view, the redemption of the whole world depended upon the action of Jews in creating the conditions necessary for messianic salvation. And you can see here, for example, uh, Yitzhak Rabin on the left with Yasser Arafat from the PLO um, after the signing of the 1993 Oslo One Accords, um, they're being greeted by President Bill Clinton. Now, like many Jewish religious militants and Messianic Jews in the 1990s, um, Yigal Amir was obsessed with rebuilding the former Jewish temple, and um, which at that time Jewish historians believed to be located um, under where the current Muslim Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And you can see a picture of Yigal Amir there on U.S. News and World Report shortly after um, he was arrested um, in court case. Now, Amir, who uh, we know from his background, was a law student at the ultra-conservative Bar Ilan University in Israel, had convinced himself and others kind of in his circles that the actions of Rabin were a direct threat to the restoration of this um, imagined religious Jewish state. And so an assassination would be acceptable under what was called the Pursuer's Decree in Jewish legal doctrine, which obliges a Jew to stop someone who is considered a mortal danger um, to Jews. And Amir reached this sort of through three different kind of arguments. One was that Rabin's government was illegitimate, particularly through negotiations he was involved in with the PLO, that Rabin's policies were anti-Jewish, um, in part because he was embracing both um, Israeli Arabs and uh, Palestinian Muslims through these various peace processes, as well as by accepting, for example, Arab um, Israelis as legitimate citizens of the Israeli state. And finally, by, uh, he felt that Rabin had committed treason by giving away Jewish land, again, as part of these various international negotiations. So in his view, he had kind of a positive obligation um, to prevent these harms to the future Jewish state. Now, a third example we read about is Brute Goldstein, who is, again, another U.S.-born doctor and Jewish settler um, who was involved in the 1994 attack on Muslim worshippers at the Cave of the Patriarch in Hebron. Um, and his acts were sparked by um, 
his own kind of anger while he was praying the night before um, when a group of disruptive Arab youths who he claimed were shouting anti-Jewish slogans um, while he was praying near the tomb of the patriarch um, on the night before Purim, the Jewish holiday celebrating the rescue of the Jews from the Persians under Xerxes I, um, which is described in the book of Esther. Now, the following day, in response to um, kind of this outrage of hearing these anti-Jewish slogans um, shouted while he was praying, um, and importantly in his mind, also the Israeli soldiers who were there ignored sort of these actions. So in response, the next day in Purim, he took his assault rifle to the cave of the patriarchs um, where Muslims were praying, opened fire, killing 29 Muslims and wounding 125 worshippers in that area. Um, and then those worshippers who were not killed immediately um, jumped on him and beat him to death. Now, after his death, um, sympathetic Jewish extremists built a monument to honor him in Kahan Square there, which was already named to honor um, Amir Kahan. And the sort of monument they put up read, he gave his life for the people of Israel, its Torah and land. Um, and as we read about, um, that kind of monument was removed in 1999 when Israel passed a law sort of outlawing the celebration of religious terrorists or terrorists more broadly. So for religious militants um, from Jewish traditions like Mir Khan, Mir Ettinger, um, Neon Yerner, Egal Amir, and Baruch Goldstein, and many others, land is really at the heart of their extremist religious claims. So for Kahan, Ettinger, and Yerner, Israel must become a state ruled by Jews for Jews under biblical law. And to do that, they must reclaim all of the historical lands. And that's precisely why um, Israeli settlements play such an important role in Jewish religious militant politics today, and also why many Jewish extremists um, are kind of at the forefront of these settler um, movements on Palestinian land that have been recognized um, as illegal, such as the ones we see here in the West Bank. And so for these uh, religious militants, reclaiming this land through these settlements is part of this larger vision um, that they have about restoring uh, a Jewish state in Israel. Now, in our final third case, the Spear of Shiva, um, Jurgens Meyer turns to look at these examples of religious um, terrorism and religious militant activist in H India in the context of Hinduism. Now, as he notes, you might be surprised to learn that the current Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, was actually banned from entering the United States and the UK prior to his election in 2014 because he was seen as a vocal anti-Muslim extremist in India and also was widely believed to have been involved in the 2002 massacres um, of Muslims by Hindu mobs in the Gujarat state. Now Modi is the current leader of the BJP, the Bhartiya Janata Dal Party, which is the ruling Hindu nationalist party in India. And he's also a former member of the Rastriya um, Swayam Savak Sangh, or the RSS, which is an armed Hindu militant organization um, that kind of serves as the political wing of the BJP. So it's not a political party, um, but it's a political organization. Both the BJP and the RSS have been widely accused of fanning the flames of communal violence in India by encouraging Hindu attacks against Muslims um, and by a whole range of exclusionary policies, some of the most recent of which include the Citizens Amendment Act or the CAA, um, which attempted to um, strip um, Muslim and other minority groups of their citizenship in India. Now, as Jurgens Meyer notes, whether the 2002 Gujarat massacre was an act of terrorism and whether government officials, including Modi himself, um, were involved, these can be described as terrorists is a contentious issue, both inside and outside of India. So there's no doubt, however, about the basic facts of the case. Perhaps as many as 2,500 innocent Muslim men, women, and children were hacked to death, stabbed, raped, and burned alive by angry, angry Hindu mobs. Um, but Jurgens Meyer points out, although it's often been described as a riot, um, that assumes that there was kind of equal amounts of violence on both sides, um, and that's certainly not the case, um, as Jurgens Meyer notes. In this case, the Muslims were almost entirely the victims of the angry Hindu mobs. Now, this deep anti-Muslim sentiment that Hindu militant religious activists and the RSS and other groups have promoted, um, which we see uh, very clearly reflected in contemporary BJP politics under Modi, um, have been a growing source of concern for many in India, 
um, given that India was formed sort of in the kind of post-colonial period as a secular democracy. So no particular religion was uh, kind of the religion of the state. But the BJP has been pushing to try to kind of slowly erode the secular politics um, since they came to power in 2014. Now, the Hindu mob in Gujarat in February 2002, particularly February 28th and March 2nd, um, was initially sparked by a fire on a train that had been carrying Hindu religious militants from the RSS and the VHP, another Hindu nationalist group, um, who had been returning from kind of a pilgrimage to Ayodhya, which itself was the site of an earlier um, conflict where a Muslim mosque had been burned down and destroyed by Hindu activists in order to erect a temple to Lord Ram. Now, the train was stopped for reasons that are still unclear before it reached the final station. A fire broke out. Um, Muslim youth and locals there in one of the villages alongside the tracks um, were blamed on um, causing the incident that led to 58 Hindu pilgrim deaths. And upon hearing this news, local militants from um, Hindu communities, as well as state media and government officials, um, including Narendra Modi, who at that time was the chief minister in Gujarat, um, blamed the Muslims for these attacks and the deaths of the Hindu pilgrims. Um, and even M um, Modi went so far as to refer to these Muslim acts as uh, Islamic terrorism against Hindus, um, further stoking um, these communal religious fears. So as we read in the um, chapter for this week, two Muslim areas were particularly hit hard um, in Gujarat, the Golbarg Society and the Roda Patia, which were on the outskirts of Gujarat. And these are really the two main areas that were focused of attacks on um, February 28th. So as our author relates, thousands of angry young men armed with stones, clubs, knives, pipes, and cans of kerosene um, attacked uh, Muslim areas. By 10.30 in the morning of February 28th, they had broken through the gates and were throwing bricks and stones, dousing the houses with kerosene and setting them on fire, and catching Muslims who were trying to flee, beating them, and in some cases ha hacking them to death with swords. As the violence intensified, women were captured and gang-raped, then doused with kerosene and burned alive. And witnesses uh, who were interviewed later reported that these Hindu mobs were chanting, kill the Muslims, during these attacks. Now, among those killed was Asan Jafri, who was not only an outspoken critic of Modi and the BJP, but also uh, a Congress Party member um, that time in the Indian government. Now, locals, uh, Muslims there, had fled to Jafri's compound in the Goldberg Society, believing that um, they would be protected since he was an Indian politician. Um, but sadly, we know that they were... Um, this was not the case. As records have shown, um, the police that were there were basically just watched the attack taking place on the compound. And even though for hours and hours, um, Joffrey and others made frantic calls and even faxes to try to get help, um, nothing, uh, no police came until almost six hours later. So as Jurgensmeyer describes it, the house um, here in the compound was set on fire and some inside were burned alive. And you can see some of the pictures of the aftermath here on that slide. Many were able to escape, but some of the women who tried to flee were caught, raped, and then set on fire. Joffrey himself was stripped naked, forced to parade in front of the crowd, and told to say, Jai Shri Ram, or Hail Lord Ram. He refused, and first his fingers were chopped off, then his hands and feet were severed, and his still breathing body was dragged down the road and thrown onto an impromptu pyre, where many other bodies were burned, including the women who had been gang raped. So it's precisely these sort of acts of communal violence um, that made the Gujarat riots one of the worst incidents in recent um, history in India. Unfortunately, similar events were taking place at that same time at Naroda Pattaya, um, where, as Jurgensmeyer notes, over 5,000 marauding young Hindu men began a 10-hour rampage, ransacking the neighborhood, throwing rocks, slashing throats, dashing kerosene on both houses and people, and burning them alive. Some in the crowd brandished, uh, brandished Shiva's three-pointed spear and used that trident to impale victims. The violence here was instigated and supported again by uh, BJP representative Maya Kodnani, who's pictured here on the right, as well as other BJP and RSS supporters. Um, initially, Kodnani was arrested and found guilty for her role, but was later um, acquitted and found not guilty of being involved in a conspiracy um, to cause these communal riots by the high court. 
Now, as Jurgens Meyer um, notes, Konani um, is an ardent supporter of Hindu nationalist causes um, who had a reputation of opposing Muslims and resisting their influence in public life. So like Konani, um, Modi remains a controversial figure in Indian politics today, both for his embrace of Hindu nationalist politics, as well as his political support for various nationalist efforts to remake India into a Hindu religious state that's outwardly hostile to its non-Hindu residents, such as through the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now, similar to both Christian and Jewish traditions, the Hindu Vedas and other religious texts are full of images of warfare and conflict. So as Jürgens Meyer points out about the Bhagavad Gita, it gives several reasons why killing in warfare is permissible. Among them, the argument that the soul can never really be killed. He who slays, slays not. He who is slain, is slain not, as the Gita um, relates. Another reason is based on dharma, or moral obligation. The duty of a member of the kshatri, or the warrior caste, by definition involves killing, so violence is justified in the very maintenance of social order. So Hindu nationalists, those in the RSS, the VHP, and other related parties, view their armed struggle as central to defending this vision of a nationalist Hindu culture in India. And this political philosophy today is what we refer to as Hindu, Hindutva. Now, the RSS, as a religious paramilitary group, um, dates all the way back to the colonial period of the 1920s. Um, for example, a member of the RSS uh, assassinated Mahatma Gandhi, and RSS members played uh, leading roles in the destruction in 1992 of the Yodhya Mosque, as well as a string of different riots um, between Muslims and Hindus that led to thousands of deaths. So as Jürgens Meyer argues, Narendra Modi and many other leaders of the Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, have come from the RSS, and the movement has been the breeding ground for kindred movements and ideologies that have developed over the years. So the Vishnu Hindu Parishad, or known as the World Hindu Council, which was founded in 64 by RSS leaders, its goal was to organize and consolidate the Hindu society and to serve to protect the Hindu Dharma or religion. And other Hindu nationalist groups that have advocated similar politics, such as the Shiv Sena, the Army of Lord Shiva, um, were, have been involved in, for example, the 1992 Ayodhya Mosque attacks, uh, riots in Mumbai in 1992 and 1993, as well as the more recent 2002 Gujarat massacre. So we kind of step back and look at all three of these cases of Christians, Jews, and, and Hindus. Um, what we see in these cultures of terror is that militant religious activists have justified their use of violence and terror to advance what they believe to be a holy cause, ending abortion in the United States, restoring biblical territories in Israel, imposing an exclusive uh, sort of Hindu nationalist religious vision of who is a real Indian in India. So in each of these cases, religious authority and power are given precedent over secular rules and norms. And in fact, in many cases, the, the very kind of existence of the secular state is itself called into question. So as Jürgens Meyer argued, one of my conclusions is this historical moment of global transformation has provided an occasion for religion with all of its images and ideas to be reasserted as a public force. Lurking in the background of much of religion's unrest and the occasion for its political revival, I believe, is the virtually global devaluation of secular authority and the need for alternative ideologies of public order. It may be one of the paradoxes of history, graphically displayed in incidents of terrorism, that the answer to the question of why the contemporary world still needs religion and of why it has suffered such public acts of violence are surprisingly the same. Okay, uh, just a few reminders about this week. So make sure you watch the four videos that are included on our weekly schedule for this week to give you more context and details about these cases. Um, and as you'll see noted there, three are shorter documentaries and one is a full length um, film, which you can also watch um, on Amazon or through the link that I provided. Uh, just a reminder, our discussion post number two uh, will be due Wednesday, July 7th in the class discussion forum, and your two peer post responses to that Wednesday post are due Friday, July 9th, again, in the discussion forum. And then we'll have our first quiz number one, which will open up on Friday, July 9th at noon, and that will cover um, all the materials from week one and week two, the lectures, the readings, and the related um, videos, and that'll be open until Sunday, July 11th at the end of the day. 
Okay, thanks everybody, and I will talk with you all again soon. Bye.